Don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, and what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men. When the world was at war, everyone turned to Hollywood for laughter. But our Fuhrer heard about your report card and decided to give you just what you want. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 comedies from the 1940s. For our series on the top comedies of all time, we've chosen comedy films per decade based on their iconic status, critical acclaim, box office success, watchability, and, of course, how funny they are. Ah, that's the old redhead. No bitterness, no recrimination. Just a good swift left to the jaw. This is part of a series of videos spanning the decades of comedic films from the 1930s to the 2000s. Oh, I wonder, the planes fly to Yosemite. Yes, what are you going to do? Well, I don't know, but I hope I'm not too late. Number 10, My Favorite Wife. Funny, that's all I, uh, oh, silly, silly. It's no accident that Cary Grant is going to show up a lot on this list. In the 40s, he was at the forefront of romance and comedy. My reputation for respectability is just as high as your hotel's. In this movie, Grant, as Nick Arden, is about to remarry after his first wife disappeared and has been presumed dead in a shipwreck. Oh, oh, that's sad. That's very sad. Things go awry when the supposedly late Ellen returns and attempts to win him back. I all thought your all performance was mighty good this evening, Sister Ellen. I thought you liked that. With Grant and Irene Dunn bringing the romance and the laughter in equal measure, My Favorite Wife also earned three Academy Award nominations. Oh, you Casanova, you. <laughs> Why, sure, darling. I, I can get dressed in four minutes. I... I have a little trouble getting fast Number 9, Adam's Rib. Finished? No. This George Cukor directed romantic comedy sees two lawyers, who also happen to be husband and wife, on opposite sides of the same case. The one case I don't want is the case I get. As it involves a woman who is accused of shooting at her husband, it's hard for them to take sides on who the real victim is. Heaven has no right like to to love to hate me. You a hell of a fury on a woman's horn. So, what ensues is an entertaining attempt at figuring out how to balance their professional lives with their love lives. Amanda, my love, why do you stay married to a legal beagle with ten thumbs? All right, Kit, that's enough. Adam's rib doesn't only deliver the laughs, but it's also got a strong message about women's rights. What do you think of a man who's unfaithful to his wife? Not nice, but... All right, now what about a woman who's unfaithful to her husband? Something terrible. Aha! Uh -huh. Where's your 12? 12. <laughs> Number eight, arsenic and old lace. Not now, not now, for heaven's sake, keep your shirt on. In this Frank Capra film, drama critic Mortimer Brewster... Hello, Mortimer! gets a rude awakening when he realizes his ants are psychopathic serial killers. Well, how did the poison get in the wine? Well, we put it in wine because it's less noticeable. When it's in tea, it has a distinct odor. To make matters worse, Mortimer is soon to be betrothed to his beloved Elaine. Do you or do you not love me? Oh, Elaine. Elaine, how could you say such a thing? Darling, of course I love you. Cary Grant injects all his charm and grace into his role as the hapless Mortimer and tries his best to reason with his beloved aunts. You mean others? More than one others? Things don't quite go his way when he's told that insanity is genetic. In short, arsenic and old lace is dark, fun, and oh so good. Pat, look out! Amazing. The greatest expedition of modern times. Almost the greatest sacrifice ever made by human man. Number seven. Sullivan's Travels. Does that give you a lump in your throat or does that give you a lump in your throat? In the 1940s, making people laugh was key, especially with war looming in the background. If I want this to be a picture of dignity, a true canvas of the suffering of humanity. But with a little sex in it. With a little sex in it. John L. Sullivan wants to do just that. But before he can direct something with real heart, he needs to experience trials and tribulations firsthand. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm not coming back till I know what trouble is. What? This Preston Sturges movie sees the title character disconnecting himself from everything he owns and knows, and setting off on his travels, all while encountering quite a few laughs in the process. Who's buying me a ticket? Sullivan. Well, what'd I ever do for him? You bought him some eggs. Hey, Mac, I need to open how he escaped. Maybe the sheriff let him out so Williams could vote for him. Oh. Number six. His Girl Friday. 
No kidding. <laughs> Cary Grant is at it again in this movie about a newspaper editor who attempts to keep his ex-wife from getting married. Excuse me, madam, are you referring to me? He's no good as a husband and knows it. But he'll be damned if he lets his ace reporter get away. You are no longer my husband and no longer my boss. Opposite Grant is Rosalind Russell, who keeps up with him in every way. And the way in which the two fast-talking reporters berate one another couldn't be more entertaining. And I still claim I was tight the night I proposed to you. If you'd have been the gentleman, you'd have forgotten all about it, but not you. Why, you... Oh, oh. You're losing your eye. You used to be able to pitch better than that. And yet, he doesn't always stick to his diet. Sometimes he swallows whole countries. Number five, to be or not to be. Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! At the height of World War II, Adolf Hitler was a prime target for cinematic ridicule worldwide and still is. Heil Hitler! Heil myself. The result was usually a satisfying send-up, and this film is no exception. Oh, we are even much funnier over Berlin. <laughs> An acting troupe sets out to test their skills by impersonating German officers in order to escape Nazi-occupied Poland. This is a very difficult place to get in, but it's much more difficult to get out. To Be or Not To Be is especially fun during the scenes where the actors attempt to accurately depict their tormentors. I don't know, it's not convincing. To me, he's just a man with a little mustache. But so is Hitler. <laughs> with elements of slapstick, satire, and more, the comedy is now considered one of the best works by actors Carol Lombard and Jack Benny, as well as director Ernst Lubitsch. How did you know? Well, it's a, it's a natural thought. Oh, a natural thought? Well, I, I hope you don't misunderstand. I, I always, well, that is, you see, we, 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 you see, Colonel, I, I hope you don't doubt my... Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! I'm sorry in a way because it would be so pleasant to buy a lovely nonsensities for somebody who never had them. Number four, The Lady Eve. Sweet forgiveness. Sweet what? Sweet forgiveness. Oh. In this screwball comedy, a world-weary socialite and a sass-talking con artist meet and fall for each other on a cruise. Oh, he does card tricks. But things don't quite go as planned. Vernon? I thought you said Herman. Vernon was Herman's friend. Barbara Stanwyck's Jean is a sharp, quick-witted, no-nonsense kind of girl who plays it straight. Would you like to come and talk to me? One notable scene sees Jean unable to keep her eyes off Charles and feeling the need to narrate his every move. He's returning to his book. He's deeply immersed in it. He sees no one except... Watch his head turn when that kid goes by. Meanwhile, her chemistry with Henry Fonda's straight-laced performance gives the two perfect comedic timing. Yes, you have a definite nose. Well, I'm glad you like it. Do you like any of the rest of me? Oh, what I meant was card playing. Sense. I know like what it's... you meant. I was just flirting with you. Number three, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello meet Frankenstein. And he walked like this. An early flick in the horror comedy genre, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein pits the eponymous dynamic comedic duo against Hollywood's most formidable movie monsters. I was reading a sign over here, this one down here, yeah. Dracula's legend. All of a sudden I heard, <coughs> that's the wind. It should get oiled. Dracula, Frankenstein's monster, and the Wolfman team up to terrorize two unsuspecting delivery men tasked with delivering the Count's coffin. Well, then it's going to cost you overtime because I'm a union man. And I work only 16 hours a day. A union man only works eight hours a day. I belong to two unions. Abbott and Costello are joined by such acting greats as Bella Lugosi and Lon Chaney Jr. to deliver the laughs and the scares. Never. Why? I heard so much about you, I feel as if we have already met. Just check out this scene in which Dracula messes with Costello's Wilbur. Yeah. <laughs> Number two, The Great Dictator. Hail Hinkle. In his previous silent films, Charlie Chaplin established himself as a hilarious slapstick comedian with a heart. Most amusing. In his first true talking endeavor. You must speak. I can't. You must. It's our only hope. Chaplin manages to keep the comedy in, but also extends a stirring message about the looming war and the dangers of dictatorship and fascism. Ah! We must tighten our belts. Take Adnoid Hinkle's famous dance with the glow balloon, which is as suggestive as it is funny. 
The Great Dictator has a lot of great moments, both touching and comical. And they're what make this a must-watch classic. Let us fight for a world of reason, a world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite! Before we unveil our pick for comedy of the 1940s, here are a few honorable mentions. I've got no right to go making suggestions like that. Let me tell you, I've got enough to do in my job without gossiping. I did not. Here, here, turn it up, will you? You're not in the ball of the Rose and Crown now, you know. Hello, hello. Give me the new old uh, Lumpar cows. Yeah, the new old. Well, for heaven's sake, I don't care what you wear. If you want to look like a pony in the circus, it's all right. But I have troubles of my own without your blouse coming between Mr. Matachek and me. Listen, I sold as much goods yesterday as anybody else in the shop. 95 Pango 50 isn't bad for a rainy Monday three weeks before Christmas. Did you tell that to Mr. Matachek? Yes, I did. And what did he say? He said, tell him not to come on that blouse anymore. Tell him I won't. I will. Well, that's the terriblest thing I ever... What's your father going to say when he finds out you, you can't... I mean, you haven't any husband. I, I mean, any proof. I, I mean, any... Who's, uh, who's he going... We just picked the wrong first husbands, that's all. <laughs> Number one, The Philadelphia Story. The Philadelphia Story. Tracy Lord and C.K. Dexter were a couple once in love and now divorced. Tracy. Oh, I give up. But with Tracy set to remarry, her former husband wants a second shot. Oh, you want to get even with your ex-bride, huh? With Katherine Hepburn as the rich socialite and Cary Grant as the alcohol-abusing ex. Don't you know that tomorrow is the wedding? Oh, that's right, so it is. The Philadelphia Story is the perfect showcase of the actor's dry and quick-witted performances. Would you mind doing something for me? Anything what? Get the heck out of here. Mix in James Stewart and you've got a romantic comedy that allows three cinematic legends to stretch their comedic muscles and that boasts two Oscar trophies to its name. Sometimes for your own sake, Red, I think you should have stuck to me longer. I thought it was for life, but the nice judge gave me a full pardon. Do you agree with our list? I heard you the first time. I like it. That's why I have to say it again. What's your favorite 1940s comedy? For more hilarious top tens published every day, be sure to subscribe to WatchMojo.com. Yours had teeth. Uh, look, Wilbur. Yours had teeth, too. Did you see that tooth? Yes, I happened to see it. Mine had so much bridge work, every time I kissed her, I had to pay toll.